Well, <clears throat> gosh, I've got some good news and I've got some bad. Uh, but well, the good news is I'm being joined by Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls, uh, who are the uh, uh, Chris is our uh, director of research, and Daryl is our director of analytics. Uh, these two crank out so much information. Uh, to help us uh, be better educated about how the investing process works, or let's say has worked uh, in many cases going back 90 plus years. And so I had a plan and everybody was on board with the plan. And that was to come out with a series of articles and podcasts and videos that would focus on what we would consider to be eight of the biggest, really slightly complex questions that investors have to decide. Forks in the road, how much in stocks, how much in bonds, and and how much in large and small stocks, how much in how much in US and international. There's a whole bunch of questions that these previous eight sessions that we did were built to answer. So I had a dream, and my dream was that people were going to read all eight articles, they were going to listen to all eight podcasts, and they were going to watch eight videos. And after they were done with that, they would have just a ton of information to make, hopefully, some of the best difficult situations or or decisions they have to make. Well, we get the numbers. We find out when we've been successful or unsuccessful in terms of reaching the people that we'd like to try to educate. And here's what I found out. I found out that one of the articles at Market Watch that we did, one out of the eight, it had 86,000 opens. Now, that's a lot of people taking a look at that article. And... Uh, I see another one here. Uh, That one, by the way, was a discussion of the sound investing portfolios, the the different ways to combine the equity asset classes that we're advocating uh, that you use. On the other hand, the article on fine-tuning your asset allocation to determine how much in stocks and bonds, we had 2,900 opens. And as I go down the list, there are two that were home runs, and the most of the rest of them were pretty average. And 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 so we really, at least I, I don't think we f- fulfilled the goals that we had for this series of articles. Now, having said that, when we look at the opens on the podcasts. Each one of them had about the same, uh, about, let's call it 10,000 opens per each podcast. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a podcast. And the videos, uh, and we had about 80,000 total uh, opens on the eight podcasts and about 28,000 video opens. So uh, we didn't accomplish exactly what we were after, but what we're going to do today Uh, is we're going to answer some questions that came in, and we're going to focus on the questions that came in to the sound investment for investing portfolios under the Market Watch article, where there's a place for people to comment and ask questions, and also under the fixed contributions. Again, there is an opportunity for people to ask questions. Now, I'm just going to encourage you, uh, if you have questions about these eight major uh, uh, decisions that we're trying to help with, uh, please. In fact, in fact, you don't have to put it in the comment section at Market Watch. You can just send it to Paul at paulmerriman.com and, and we'll, we'll put it in our, our bag of Q&A and hopefully get to as many of them as we can short term and give us a little longer and hopefully we'll get to all of them. But today, we're going to be talking about the sound investing portfolios, their risk and return, the history of the risk and return, 
and fixed contribution. So, Daryl and Chris, if you are ready, uh, let's let's take some of these comments and questions. Ready to go. All right. So the first one uh, is not a not a question. It's a comment. And I am always a believer in getting the bad news out of the way first and the good news after the bad news. And here's somebody who, who, who says, I love Paul's podcasts, but I wish they could be condensed down to 30 minutes. They're way too long and a little dull. So I read that and I took it to heart and I thought a lot about it. And I think that when the three of us get together, it can't be dull because we've got three voices and three thought, different ways of thinking about these, uh, uh, this, this process. And I can understand listening to one voice drone on and on. Maybe you're feeling that way right now, actually. Uh, But there's a good possibility. I will try to keep my work down to about 30 minutes when I'm on my own, unless I hear different. I've got to hear from you. And then uh, you can vote if you wish, paul at paulmerriman.com. Tell me whether 30 or 60 you would prefer. And uh, But I'm not going to be held to 30 minutes when I've got these two smart guys here uh, to help me. So uh, I just wanted to make that, that comment. Now, um, I like this first question. And I want to pose this question for all three of us. But Uh, The question was, may I ask how long you have been personally invested in the small cap value strategy and how much of your portfolio is in small cap value? So I'm going to, Daryl, would you have any idea what your percentage of small cap value is? Um. Probably not exactly. Um, About. I think the last time I looked at it, uh, it was around 25 or 30%. All right. That's um, great. Uh, it's a little, that's a little lower than it's been uh, in the past. On the other hand, I am, I am older now than I was. And so, so and I'm retired, and so I, to a certain extent, I de-risked the portfolio a little bit by by uh, lowering a little bit of the small cap value. So I don't think that 25 to 30 percent is out of line with someone who's been retired almost 10 years. So, and that is 25 to 30 percent of the equity part of your portfolio, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, actually, actually, no. Oh, it's it's of the whole portfolio. Oh. That is that is aggressive. And on the other hand, yeah. On the other hand, uh, I'm pretty much a hundred percent equity. So ah, and, and how well, maybe how I, maybe I haven't de-risked now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and how how long have you been investing in small cap value, Daryl? About twenty years. Twenty years. Yeah, that's great. And what about you, Chris? You know, the I have to start by saying I always think these are a little bit funny, these questions, because uh, everybody's situation is really different. But I can kind of understand where it's coming from. I think people are wondering, do you put your, your money where your mouth is, right? You know, do you walk the talk? So uh, I have in one part of my portfolio in one of my accounts, I have recently switched it entirely to a two fund for life strategy. And in that account, I was actually very aggressive. I'm 50% target date fund and 50% small cap value. Overall, uh, our our plan was to be something like 20%, 20 to 25% in small cap value. And um, partly because I'm buy and hold and I don't rebalance regularly. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, that's closer to 13 or 14% today, just because of the way other things in the portfolio have moved around. Uh, I don't actually, I don't think that for me or for anybody else that necessarily is the best way to manage it. But I have said it before and I'll say it again. I think of my portfolio as a bar of soap. Every time I touch it, it gets smaller. And so, 
I do tend to be very hands off as a buy and hold investor and do my rebalancing less frequently than even academics would probably say is, is beneficial. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, at age almost 80, uh, in, in our portfolio, in the buy and hold part of our portfolio, we are half in equities and half of those equities are in small cap. And about half of the small cap is small cap value. And, and so for somebody our age, that would probably be considered uh, a, a lot of uh, small cap value. On the other hand, that money is not likely to be for my, my wife and myself, but it'll be for our kids. And so in, in many ways, the money that we have invested uh, is focused on others that, that that survive us rather than ourselves. So we try to take that in, into consideration when we determine uh, the asset allocation. Now, as far as how long I've been in small cap value, let me let me pose it a slightly different way or answer it this way. In about 1994, our firm started working with dimensional funds. And at that point, um, all of our buy and hold accounts uh, had small cap value as a part of the portfolio. What of course would be different from person to person would be how much in equities, how much in fixed income, but uh, we tried to keep a balance of the small and the large and the value uh, and the blend. And we'll get a chance to look uh, in a few minutes at the long-term return of having that kind of a balance in terms of risk and return. And it's, it's actually turned out, uh, I think, to be a pretty good uh, strategy. Okay, uh, next one here is, um, this one's an easy one for you, Chris. Uh, this uh, fellow wants to know uh, about the use of the uh, the Vanguard um, total market index uh, versus the S and P five hundred. And so the first question is: uh, Is there a preference? And after you answer that, I would love to hear you address your preference for the Avantis. Uh, large cap uh, uh, blend fund. So uh, what do you say? I think all three are great choices. Uh, and I think the differences that you're likely to see on a year to year basis are small. Uh, we know historically the the correlation or the, the similarity between the total market and the S&P 500 return is almost one. So they're, they're almost the same thing. Um, so in choosing between those two, for me, I think it comes down to regret avoidance and what you want to have in your mind about what you own. If you own the total market, when somebody comes up to you at a party and says, hey, did you hear about stock XYZ I just bought in? You know, you can go, well, I got some of that, right? Because odds are in the thousands and thousands of stocks that are in that fund, you own some. And so you, you don't have to wonder, am I participating in everything that's happening out there? Am I benefiting from all of these cool, innovative things going on? Uh, if that doesn't bother you, and you have a preference towards uh, a, a committee chosen set of stocks that are deemed to be better in some way, then go ahead and invest in the S&P 500. But it is effectively a, a, a committee chosen thing uh, filtered on some good criteria like profitability, that's, that's one of the criteria, uh, but the actual return is not gonna change very much. Now, why do I recommend the Avantis AVUS fund instead? Well, our portfolios are all built on the idea that a tilt towards small and value is going to give you a higher long-term return and a higher long-term return per unit of risk. And AVUS tilts a little bit towards smaller and a little bit towards value, only a little. 
but enough to justify the higher expense ratio that they charge, at least based on history and what you would expect the premiums to be. It should give you a higher return. It, it's also not going to track the S&P 500 perfectly, though. So if you're going to lose sleep over the fact that sometimes it does a little bit worse and sometimes it does a little bit better, you should probably stick to the S&P 500 or the total market, either of those. Uh, so I think it really is a very personal thing in terms of choosing which of those you go with, but the actual returns probably not going to be substantially different, at least not year to year. I mean, in the long run, we hope that there's a substantial advantage to AVUS, but who knows, it could take 10 years plus for that to show up. Yeah. And and just for the sake of the discussion, um, what what would you think you might get in terms of an additional premium for that additional risk? I mean, are you thinking a, a half a percent a year, 1% a year? Um, what, what would you think the academics would, would, uh, would guess? Well, I'd have to go back and pull out my analysis to ballpark it, but, uh, or, or to, to be confident in the answer. But I think it's probably, like you said, something in the, you know, half a percent to 1% over the long term that you might benefit from all of the various filters that they apply to what's in that fund. So on any given year, you might, you might, underperform by 2% or 3% and then kick yourself and say, well, I'd, I paid a higher expense ratio and I didn't get anything for it. And that's the tricky part, right? Because you can get an S&P 500 or total market for so cheap that you're not going to worry about the expense. Um, so yeah, I, I think the difference is going to be small and to get it, you're going to have to stick with it over time. Well, and just a, one, one number that I, that I noted, uh, I think the average size company, uh, capitalization-wise, uh, number of shares times the price in the market is around sixty-three billion dollars. So those are not small companies. Right. But I think the S and P five hundred may be a hundred and fifty plus billion dollars. So there is a difference in size, and uh, and of course we'll have to wait and see. How that works out. Now, the second question that came from this young person, because uh, he has indicated he's in his mid 30s, and he wants to know is just adding the, the, the small cap value to the SP 500 or the total market index, is that enough diversification? I, th I think it is. Um, the performance of the portfolio is going to come down to what parts of the market are you tapping into and what are those returns. We know, though, from Daryl's quilt chart work that if you have more funds in the portfolio, uh, the, the results are a little more predictable. So like if you look at the four fund solution, it's going to more uh, regularly give you the performance uh, that that you expect. When you look at the two fund solution, it's a little bit more dispersed. You get you get a little more spread in what what you get. So I think that there are advantages to having more funds in the portfolio, but I don't think those advantages are a higher long term return. And I don't think it's even necessarily a higher long-term return per unit of risk. I think it's more the smoothness of the ride. We, you know, if you look at the Larry portfolio, which is short-term bonds and small cap value, it's two funds and it gives you one of the highest returns per unit of risk you can get. And it gives you some of the steadiest performance over time that you can get. Uh, you know, you it it very rarely disappoints. It a uh, vast number of years is going to give you a positive return. Uh, so uh, there's you don't have to have a lot of funds. Um, I don't I don't think that's necessary. But there are some advantages to having more more funds, and there is some advantage in terms of diversification to the ten fund solution and having exposure to a wider range of geographies with emerging markets and having the REITs in there. But our back tests say that those benefits are small. So if you don't want the complexity, then stick with one of the simpler ones. And 
invest like Rip Van Winkle, look away and you'll do well. <laughs> well, and by the way, uh, Larry's portfolio, that's Larry Swedro. Yes. Uh, one of our truth tellers. And uh, uh, he does some, some remarkable work. Uh, okay. And, and, and just my, my internal compliance officer is reminding me that when I say look away and you'll do well, you will probably do well. Oh, good. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. But history suggests you'll do well. That's right. Okay. Well, um, here's an, uh, a comment. Um, it's a little cutting. Uh, and, and, and David says uh, this channel uh, here he's referring uh, to the to the video. This channel would be cutting edge if only it was 1970. In other words, he was looking at a video that is that is showing the results from 1970 through the end of 2022, and he's saying basically, look, anybody can look backward and 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 know what you should have done. Now, I think there's a huge difference between looking backward at indexes of thousands of companies in your portfolio and looking backwards and, and, and picking, putting all your money in Microsoft in 1986. I mean, it's, it, it, yes, we, we can always look backwards and see that. But I liked, I, I liked David's comment, and, and, I, and it, I think it makes an interesting point. That we haven't addressed before, and Daryl, uh, uh, Daryl agreed to do a little research on this one because let's pretend, let's go back to 1970. Let's put us uh, in the same role that we are right now, trying to tell people what to do for the future based on what we know from the past. And so, in 1970, we're doing a podcast and a video on this. And uh, Daryl, what would we have known? about the past in 1970? Well, I, I took a look at uh, some index data from uh, DFA, from their returns website, and I looked at, at the four major asset classes, the uh, US uh, large cap blend, actually it's the S&P 500 index in this case, but and then uh, US large cap value index, a US small cap blend index, and the U.S. small cap value index from 1927 to 2023. So when, when David asked, what would we have known in 1969 or 1970, let's say, um, this is what we would have known looking back. This is asset class indexes. This is their compound annual growth rate over the period 27 to 69. This is the S&P 500 index large cap value index, small cap blend index, and small cap value index. So when I see this and I look at this, these are large and these are small. So in 1969, if I looked at the previous, whatever this is, 43 years of historical data, I would have said, hmm, looks like small is better than large. No significant bias towards value over blend, but small is better than large. So that's kind of an interesting observation. Uh, so David asks a good question. So what happened in the next, what is it, 53 or 54 years here? Hmm. So here's our large cap or small cap blend, and here's our small cap value. And then here's our large cap blend and our large cap value. So things didn't exactly pan out the way we thought they would, although it's not bad here if you look at the small cap blend and small cap value. Large cap value did a little better. Uh, even large cap blend it did better than it had done in the previous 40 years, but it's still uh, in this case, it's not as good as any of the other three ones, whereas before it was about the same as large cap value. So it's an interesting question. Um, what that tells me is that uh, even really, it, well, it tells me two things. First of all, backtesting can never tell you what's going to happen in the future. That's the second thing. 
they're the first thing. The second thing is that uh, things change. Um, even 40 years is not enough time necessarily of backtesting to give you an idea if you're looking for precision about what's going to happen in the future. Um, so it's a good question. If you look at the next or if you look at the whole period, this is kind of the way things things lay out. And it's actually kind of interesting that they actually lay out the way you might expect them to lay out over a long enough period of time. But what this chart tells you is that 40 or 50 years may not necessarily be long enough. These are indexes again, so there's no cost associated with them. There's also no way you could have bought any of these indexes probably for the first 40, 50 years of this period. So it's it's an academic study, um, but and, and it's and the indexes are done by DFA, so I trust their methodology. Um, so it's but it's an interesting comparison um, and a good question to ask. It it does make the idea of, of sp spreading the money amongst all four of the asset classes uh, a savvy thing to do, at least again looking backwards. Uh, but thinking of of what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, that combination of small cap value and the S and P 500 uh, would have would have, would have performed well out there at the edges because the edges of value, the edges of growth, the edges of size, of large and of small. So, uh, and by the way, we're gonna there's a, there's a fellow who uh, commented. Um, and I'll, I'll mention it right now since you have this information up here, Daryl. And somebody said that it's unfair to show the returns from 1970 to 19 to 2020, uh, 22. Now, these are actually through 22, right, Daryl? Well, they're actually through April 2023. Oh, so. I, I got it. Okay. Okay. I, thank you. I, I didn't see that. So, so, um, but he's but he has taken the position that it's unfair because the performance has been so much better over the last uh, fifty three plus years. Uh, and in fact, there is there there is a slight well, certainly for the s and p five hundred, uh, it made about an extra one percent a year. And that's not a small number uh, over a long period of time. but but it's um, it's really the other asset classes that have, uh, well, I guess the big winner was small cap value. Is that a fair statement? Because uh, the, the small cap blend is up a little over the earlier period. The, uh, well, the, the large cap value is up about 2%. From yeah, the if you actually look at this, yeah. um, you know, when we said that the first 40 years, it was small, the second 50 years, it's actually value because this is this is three some plus 3.4 percent higher, and this is 3.3 percent higher than it had done in the previous 40 years. So, the yeah. first roughly half percent, first 40 percent of this period, it was small. The second 60 percent of the period was value. So, yeah. good point. Thank you, thank you, Daryl. Uh, now here, Keith asks a question about putting money uh, into ETFs uh, and trying to decide how to put that money in because many places where you invest in ETFs, you have to buy full shares. So you can't just say, I want $100 of small cap value. You have to, if it's a $60 share, you can buy one share. And the rest of the money is sitting there. So, so Keith asks whether uh, the way to do this is to uh, maybe accumulate some money uh, and then buy just one particular fund at a time uh, to make it more efficient. Uh, and he, he doesn't he doesn't say whether he's buying two funds or six funds or whatever. But I thought this is an opportunity to let Keith know his other choices. Uh, at M1 and 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 at uh, uh, Fidelity. So, want to just comment about that? The great thing, if you can set it up someplace like at M1, is that you can automate it. And 
all of the behavioral studies say that if you can automate it, you're much more likely to stick with it because it doesn't involve thought and personal involvement and the chance to second guess your decisions. And you can do that at Fidelity. I think Schwab allows frac fractional share purchases now too. There's a lot of places where you could do that. So I think my bias would be towards automation as the first priority. But if if that's not possible and you're stuck with trying to figure out how to do this with discrete purchases of individual uh, share chunks, then I would use nudge balancing or nudge rebalancing with the contributions in the same way we use nudge rebalancing and withdrawals, only the reverse. So I would just take that next chunk of money you got coming in and figure out which asset is least uh, or is underrepresented the in your portfolio. <laughs> yeah. What's that, Daryl? The furthest behind. Yeah, the one that's the furthest behind. So if you're supposed to have half and half and one of them is 40% and the other one's 60%, then buy the thing that's 40%, right? So you could simplify and every time you do it, that'll nudge you back towards being rebalanced. But my strong bias would be to try and automate it if you can, even if that involves changing brokerages, because once you automate it, it won't take any of your mental cycles. You won't, it'll just happen and you'll you'll do better probably. I, I yeah, do the, think- the, the context ahead. of this, the context of this question, led me to think that maybe this is in a 401k or something like that. And they may not have the option to, to pick who their broker is. So I think using your nudge contributions or nudge rebalancing is a good approach in this case. Yeah. And yeah, in this case, he's doing a Roth IRA. So he, he, he okay. does note that, but I do think at Schwab, that um, they allow the partial share of Schwab funds. At Fidelity, I believe they do partial shares of all ETFs. So, uh, so that's really a good deal. And we also need to disclose that if you go to M1 through our link, and if you open up an account there, uh, we get a one-time small fee from M1. It's important that you understand that. Uh, and that doesn't go to me or the or or Chris or Daryl. It goes to the foundation. But uh, I I do believe that Fidelity will have that uh, capability in the future. That's I think is the direction the in, the industry is going. The more automation, uh, the better. Uh, thanks, thank thank you, Chris. Well, we've got another. Uh, I think really interesting question here from uh, uh, from one of the uh, of the viewers, and I just want to give you a little background here so you know where this is coming from. What we recommend is uh, if you're going to, for example, use the four fund U.S. strategy, we recommend the S and P 500, which is a large cap blend, uh, and a small cap blend along with large cap value and small cap value. But uh, this viewer says, ah, my question is why, when I use portfolio visualizer with 20% each of US large value, US small value, and US large growth, and US small growth, now that's instead of blend, instead of large blend, small blend, he's saying go with the growth plus the total bond market. It crushes the uh, the use of large cap blends. So, so Daryl, give us a, um, a a little background of what 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 you found when you do in fact use growth instead of blend uh, in terms of. Oh, by the way. And he does note that his study is from 1987. So given that uh, he's looking at a special period of time here, uh, what does it look like from your analysis? 
Well, he uses Portfolio Visualizer, and that constrains your time interval to 1987 to 2023. Um, so what I did was go back, and he claims that his four fund plus the total bond, when compared to the S&P 500, uh, he claims the S&P crushes it. In other words, I assume I interpret crushes it to mean that the S&P 500 just beats the pants off of his four fund value and growth combination. So I, I looked at that and I said, hmm. So I went to Portfolio Visualizer and did the analysis. And this is what I, let me share this here. And this is what I found. Backtesting and asset allocation here. And so I put in large growth, large value, small growth, small value, total bond, 20% each. That's portfolio one. Then portfolio two is 80% total market, as a total US market. Um, which is roughly the S and P 500, and a 20% bond total bond, and then our four fund recommendation, which is 20% uh, large value, 20% small value, 20% uh, large blend, 20% small blend, and 20% total bond. So each of these, all four of these, are 80% equities, 20% uh, bonds, total bond. And it constrains the analysis, let me analyze these. It con constrains the analysis to January 87, since that's the first time that Portfolio Visualizer has the total bond market available. And so it runs it through that through May 23. So here are your asset allocation tables. You go down here and you look at the portfolio summary, performance summary, I don't see any crushing going on. Um, the the Kagers are about the same. The uh, the the small or the value and growth combination had a nine point seven one. The S uh, Kager, the S and P five hundred and eighty percent and twenty percent total bond had nine point four, and the U S four fund the way we define it with small or with value and blend uh, had a nine point five three, and they all ended up within a few tens of K out of about three hundred K at the end of the whatever this is, 40 some odd year period, um, 30 some odd year period. So I don't see any crushing going on. Um, the, in fact, the, the two four fund uh, portfolios pretty much trace each other pretty well. There's a little, little period here in the well, last five years or so, maybe here, four or five years where uh, the, uh, Let's see, this would have been the growth portfolio, the small value or the value plus growth instead of the value plus blend actually did a little better, but that's a small period out of the whole thing. They're, they pretty much track each other pretty well. Um, so, so, so Daryl, what happens if we make the change and uh, we add uh, the internationals, the, the worldwide four fund? Uh, or since 87, internationals have not performed uh, as well as U.S., so I suspect it would probably trail. Um, Actually, but before we do that, uh, what would happen if you switch total U.S. bond to U.S. intermediate term bond? Just I think that might give us more history, right? Intermediate term treasury? Yeah, Goes back to 72. Good. Yeah. So now we go back to 72. And uh, yeah, there's, it's a safer, it's a safer bond. Um, so it's a little bit different. But now when you look at them, um, portfolio three, our portfolio, the one that we recommend actually outperforms the, the growth portfolio. Not by a lot. I wouldn't say that's a trouncing either. But and I, and I don't know whether it would be significant. It's only two tenths of a percent in case. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it just goes to show, though, that a little bit of a change in the history can change the conclusions in these small differences. And uh, you know, you have to decide what you believe. If you believe the 1987 to 2023 history is compelling, and you want to invest that way, you'll probably do fine. Um, you know, especially if it gives you the conviction to stick with it. 
Uh, but we tend to value longer histories wherever we can get them. And so that's why I, I wanted to look at it that way. Sure. So, so Chris, what is the underlying uh, investment that we're looking at with Portfolio Visualizer uh, compared to what we would look at if we're looking at the, for example, the DFA indexes that, uh, that go back through this period? Uh, he has that in his uh, disclosures on the website. He uses uh, funds wherever possible. Yeah. And uh, so I haven't found the differences to be very big That's between great. DFA and Portfolio Visualizer. They're very similar. That's great. That's great. Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, here's a question. I'm 52, retired all equities and intend to stay all equities throughout my life. I have chosen to put my entire portfolio into the worldwide all value portfolio. It has uh, a two more. In fact, uh, can we do Daryl? Could we get the, uh, uh, what is it? H one up so we can look at this because uh, this is the, the, um, the the page of returns uh, where you where you did the work uh, uh, of the sound sound portfolios going from seventy to uh, twenty two. There we go. So uh, you got the highlighter uh, highlight if you would the all value worldwide kind of in the middle of the page. Here it is, uh, right here. Yeah. And so the, the, the he notes it has two more profitable years than the S and P five hundred, uh, forty four profitable years versus forty two for the S and P five hundred. It made 08 percent more than the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Now they just for what it's worth, the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Uh, in this period, compounded at what is it, eleven point eight? Correct. Uh, how much? Eleven point eight. Correct. Eleven point eight. Okay. And the S and P is ten point four. Uh, and that the worldwide uh, all value did two point two percent more than the S and P five hundred. So, so what's not to like about the now, other than it's not going to look like the S&P 500. It's not going to look like small cap value. It's going to be large and small cap, U.S. and international. What's not to trust about what we're looking at here? Did he say he's retired? He is retired, yes. Yeah. So I think the biggest question, and he doesn't provide any information about this, is uh, what withdrawal rate does he need to live on? He's 52, so. Right, but we know nothing about how much he has saved and what his spend rate is. Right. So if right. if he needs 4% to live on out of his nest egg per year uh, steadily, uh, historically, that's a safe withdrawal rate, and it would probably be fine. But if he needs, let's say, just for sake of argument, 5% to live on, and the worst drawdown in this history going back to, this is 1972, is that right? 1970, yeah. Okay, so so the worst drawdown here was what? 42%. That was the worst year. Is that the worst drawdown? Let's just say for sake of argument, it was. Oh, I, we I don't think really have, we don't have it here. Hard. I have to go get the fine tuning table up to look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, I th but, but let's say let's say his portfolio dropped by a factor of two, you know, that it divides by two, which is a reasonable worst drawdown to expect. And he needed six percent. Well, now he needs twelve percent. That would be a problem. Yeah. He's all equity, right? It, on the other hand, if his withdrawal rate is three percent, and it goes down by two, and he needs six percent some years, then it's probably fine. So I, I think all equity makes sense if you are oversaved. If you're if you got twice as much money, you can ride out the ups and downs. 
if you are just enough saved or you're, you know, you're right at the boundary or you're undersaved, then I think the all equity uh, becomes a problem because you, you you can't cut your expenses enough in those years when the market's down to still be prudent. And, and so then the question, if, 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 all equity is okay if he's got enough extra money. Um, is there a reason that you would that you would pick another combination? Uh, I, I guess if we think about what uh, Daryl showed us from the period from 1928 to 1969, um, size paid a premium, but value didn't. Uh, but he's going to have half of his portfolio in size that has been that small, in small small value. Well, if you don't have any any more warnings that you want to make for that, <laughs> well, I the, I like that he has studied it. I like that he's got a feel for what the risks and the rewards are compared to the alternatives, and yep. I like that he sounds confident in it. So, uh, I, you know, those things all really matter. It's very personal. If it's what he can stick with with conviction and the volatility that he's likely to see doesn't exceed his ability to stick with it or his okay. ability to ride out the storm, then it could very well be perfect for him. Thank you. Know, I'd, I'd, I'd make a couple of comments here. Um, if you look at the volatility, if you look down in the – in the red box there, if you look at the average down year loss, so that's, I guess, how many, there were that nine down years in this 53 year period. And the average down year loss, these are calendar years, was 16%. That's the largest of any of the nine portfolios we have there. So when it went down, it went down more than any of the other ones average loss was. Um, so, so that's something to think about. And that speaks to the, the downside volatility that uh, that Chris mentioned. The other thing is that um, this is this portfolio is different than the S and P five hundred or total market portfolio. So if you want to be different, you should expect it to be different, and it is different. And so it'll be down when the S and P is up. You can look at the quilt charts in the past to see that. Um, so. Yeah, if you can if you can stomach and you can tolerate being different in order to achieve a different result, then I think it's a, I think it's an okay choice. But uh, you have to know yourself in that case. So I would add one more thing there, Daryl. And and yes, the average size loss is slightly higher, but notice it's only nine. Right. Years instead of eleven, so I'm going to guess, and I haven't looked this up, that those other two years are years the S and P 500 probably lost a relatively small amount, and the the, the value went up a small amount, and and that by the time you take that into consideration, it may be that the losses were really not much different. But there is a two-year advantage of profitable years. Uh, okay, I, w I would I would say that a little bit differently. Okay, over the last fifty-three years, there were two years more that the all value did better than, or was up when uh, two more years than the S and P was up. Uh, I'm not sure that's a statistically significant number over to be basic to be making a decision on that. You know, I. I I just don't see that as being a big difference. Um, okay, that's great. I just just one last thing. Um, if he's listening, <laughs> and <clears throat> and he heard the bit that you said about being different, Daryl, and that concerns him. If you look over at the U.S. two fund solution, where you've got half in small value and half in the S&P 500. Now you have half of your portfolio that's not different at all. You get to experience what's going on in the news and the price you pay in terms of Kager from going from worldwide all value to the US2 fund historically was only 0.4%. Now, I mean, 
I'd love to have another 0.4%. So that's not, not nothing, but the risks were a lot lower too. The drawdown. Yeah, look at the, so that, look, yes. Yeah, so that Draw might be an interesting the nudge down is your to loss. own some of the S and P five hundred. Not even yeah. half of your portfolio necessarily, but own some, right? That might be a way to mitigate that tracking error concern. Yeah, this so, is kind of interesting. Just as an aside here, if you look at the average down year loss for the S and P five hundred, it was fourteen and a half. For the U S two fund, it was eleven point eight. And the U S two fund is the S and P and U S small cap value. But look at what the average down loss was for the all small cap, all U.S. small cap value is thirteen point seven. So this is diversification, saving yeah. your, saving your buyer. So so anyway, let's look at just an observation. Let's look at one more thing that he may not have noted. Can you bring up the other uh, H? What is it? One hundred two or two hundred one? Um, that shows the 70-30, 70% U.S., 30% international, because there there is Here some significant difference. And uh, so does that change anything? Uh, out of curiosity, it, it, it's about 5.9 million at the end of the 53 years. And I don't think it was that high uh, 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 in the H1. Let's just briefly see H1. Uh, H1, it was 5.3 and 12.6 and H102. I'm sorry, the the 50-50, this is the 50-50. It was 5.3 million with a 12.6 Kager. And if you go 70% US, 30% international, it's 5.9 total with the 12.8 Kager. And your average down year loss down here that we were looking at, it's essentially this exactly the same yeah. as the S&P 500. And the number of down years is essentially the same. It, it, I mean, they're all pretty much the same. So. so that is simply a matter of value did better in the US over this period of time than it did international. I mean, is there anything, any other conclusion that we would make? No, um, I hope he's listening. Uh, Dan says, all this data from the past 50 years looks great, but I don't feel as confident in the US economy and therefore its companies going forward with the strength of the dollar the way it is. Any thoughts on this and how it may change one's strategy on selecting the right funds for my portfolio? Um, well, this sounds like a market timing question to me, but uh, do you read anything else into that uh, uh, other than a market timing decision? Well, it's uh, diversification is good. And, and diversification is a great way to deal with a concentrated country risk. So I, I think his instincts are valid. You should always be worried about any concentrated risk, whether it's one company, one country, one sector, whatever it is. So I, I don't actually, I, I don't think that's as much a market timing concern, although the way he phrased it is a market timing concern. I, I think that should just be part of everyone's concern. You don't wanna have concentrated risk if you don't need to. So you should have some of your portfolio internationally. And in his case, I would try, I, I would hope he'd come down on the side of what he's comfortable with for the long term and not try and flail and do the market timing as you suggest, right. but it's prudent. It's prudent to be internationally diversified. This is a, to me. This is a, it's a it's kind of timing. It's also recency bias, mm -hmm. and uh, and so yeah. If if I do admit that this is one thing that does bother me about the U.S. two fund portfolio or the U.S. four fund portfolio is that it is concentrated geographically. So, and that's well, my 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 daughter who first suggested the two fund kind of solution does it as four funds 
She's half in U.S. large, half in international large, half in U.S. small value, and half in international small value. Uh, and I think that's a very prudent way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's another, it's another, uh, it's a different derivative of the worldwide four fund. Yeah, um, it's it it's a different way to get to the same kind of tilts towards small and value. Yeah, yeah. Are we going to have to add that because we because it, <laughs> it's in the in the family? And I like that. We'll at least have to take check on it from time to time to see you how know, it's, it's not a bad way to look at it that's that's i was thinking of doing this you know when i looked at the us2 fund if you want international you can go ahead and you could do a 70 30 yep us international like she's done um and that's probably not a you know large large blend on on uh us and international and small value on us and international so here's a question. What would you think a 72-year-old retiree using 4% rule should make up their portfolio? No new annual additions. So obviously, we don't know enough about uh, this uh, person. But if you had to give him one portfolio that would probably be good for the rest of his life, however long that is, would it be 50-50, 60-40, I'd say it should have a lot of equity and some bonds and some small cap value or tilts to small in value. And I don't think the actual percentages are are nearly as critical as it having some meaningful amount of each of those ingredients. Um, because if you look at the the safe withdrawal rate back testing that was done by Bengen, he started with a balanced portfolio um, that had a mix of stocks and bonds. And uh, what he has said more recently, and I've found this in my testing as well, is that if you add a meaningful allocation to small cap value that increases the safe withdrawal rate because it increases the the diversification of the portfolio makes it more resilient to the sequence of returns so i i think that's really the starting point and then anything more detailed you'd probably have to know a lot more than we do yeah right. i would say that that in bengen's studies and and a lot of the other studies that have looked at this since then have shown that an uh, that an equity fixed income allocation of between fifty and sixty five percent, somewhere in that range, um, will will maximize your for a given portfolio will maximize your your safe withdrawal rate, which is another way of looking at maximizing the resiliency of your portfolio, as Chris said. So. But, you know, on the other hand, I think it depends a lot. You know, he's 72 year old. He's the same age as I am. OK, so it depends a lot on a lot of other things um, in terms of, of your overall portfolio, how much you've saved versus how much you have have uh, what your expenses are. Um, it's it's a complex thing. You, you I don't think you can really provide a, a one size fits all answer without knowing more. And the other part that an advisor would want to know is, what is your history as an investor? Yes. Actually buy and hold. Have you done that? And when you didn't continue to buy and hold, tell me about why you changed the portfolio. And pretty soon you'll be finding out whether or not this person is even going to be able to likely buy and hold, in which case, if you're not going to be able to buy and hold, you better be heavy on bonds. Because you're likely to be ba bailing out of the of of the market at the very worst time. That's the I think the tricky part about trying to give people advice if we don't know how they've acted uh, in the past. And I think everybody knows, but just to be clear again, we can't advise anyone, uh, this listener or anyone else, because we don't have the time to ask all those questions. Yep. Exactly. You know, I have a whole bunch of other questions here, but I, uh, taking the, the the critique of our 
the length of our of our presentations. I have no idea how long we've been working today. What do you know? How long, Chris? Well, we've been on the phone for two hours. <laughs> I'm I'm guessing we have at least an hour of content, but I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. And if we're being dull here, that's probably about as much dullness as one person could take. So absolutely. You guys, you guys did a great job. I really appreciate it. And we'll take this up on another day. In the meantime, please, if you have not read, listened, watched the information on all eight of these presentations, and we'll have them in the notes so that you can go right to the page where they are all described so you can uh, uh, pick up with you where you left off. Uh, I hope you will. We, we just, our job is to help you be a better investor and we're, we're doing all we can to, to, uh, to come to that conclusion for you, make you a better investor. Guys, thanks very much. And, um, We'll uh, we'll we'll see you in the next few weeks.